Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Equitable Grading Strategies for Online Teaching. We hope everyone is in the right place. And today we're honored to have Dr. Bree Brown and Suzanne Joaquin presenting today. And uh, Dr. Brown is Assistant Professor of English and Distance Ed Coordinator at Cuyamaca College. Suzanne is the coordinator for DE, SLO, and OER, and biology faculty at Butte College. And both have really been pioneers in equitable grading. I uh, had the honor of working with them and just helping out when they presented at OTC over the summer. So uh, I'm confident that you'll learn a lot and it will really help you uh, with your grading strategies. Um, some, well, let me go to this next. We do have um, equitable grading strategies um, courses coming up. Currently, um, EGS 3 that begins in April, currently it's full, but you could put your name on the wait list. And then we also have, and not to be confused with the numbers in reverse, but uh, EGS2 is coming up on June 3rd as well. And last I checked, there's one seat left. So if that gets filled up, you could also put your name on the wait list um, and see if you can get in at that point. Let me also drop the link to this registration in the chat. So there you go. And I will be adding the link to the slides uh, in a bit here. So some housekeeping here for the this Zoom meeting. It is a meeting, not a webinar format. So you're welcome to um, use the chat. Hold on, let me get the right slide here. I thought I had a slide. Okay, well, I don't have a slide. So uh, you're welcome to use the chat. And again, like we talked about here uh, for a second, uh, you can select the captions uh, button on your menu for Zoom. And um, so we'll go from there. I'll, I'll be helping out with the chat, uh, put your questions in there. And I'll hand it over now to uh, to Bree and Suzanne. So everyone, welcome. Thanks. Excellent. So on the next slide is a little bit of an overview of what we're doing today. We're going to do um, essentially two things. One is investigate traditional grading as a source of power that privileges some students and leaves others out. We're also going to reflect on a few different grading practices, which will help you look at your current practices and, um, and consider ways that you, to make those more equitable. And then at the, the last bullet point is actually a reminder that much of this information comes from the equitable grading classes, uh, ex equitable grading strategies class that you can take if you want to do a deep dive into these topics, because in 50 minutes, we're just not going to be able to do all that much. So the agenda for today, we're going to start, as I mentioned, with um, looking at how we got here. So the inequities that exist currently. Then we're going to look at opportunities for sharing and shifting power in our classes. So we're going to look at, um, what is that, five or six? smaller things that you can do in your classes to help make grading more equitable. And then we'll we'll have at the very end just a little bit of time to look at some systemic changes, but um, we won't have too much time for that. So on the next slide is kind of an overview of the um, the way that this content is presented both in the session today and in the equitable grading cl strategies class, where Traditional grading is on the left, and you can see that it's a very one directional thing. The large sphere is me, the teacher, and all the small spheres are my students, and it's a one way flow of information. On the far right is more equitable grading, where it's a, a network, and we're all working together, me and the students, and all the students with each other. 
And the way to get us from one end of that spectrum to the other is first you identify what the problem is, right? So that's the seeing the inequities because you can't make change unless you identify what needs to change. And then you can slowly start shifting that, um, that source of power from the instructor to more um, dispersed amongst the whole group. And as I mentioned, we're gonna look at the seeing inequities. We'll get to the second two spheres a little bit today, and then we'll hint at that last sphere. Okay, so on the next slide is, um, is where Bree takes us. Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks, Sean, for the intro as well. Um, so like Suzanne mentioned, we're going to first start off with uh, seeing the inequities to discover where these inequities lie with regards to uh, traditional educational systems and traditional grading. Uh, and this will help us to establish why equitable grading strategies are a valid intervention uh, to contribute to mitigating these equity gaps. And so on the next slide, um, I'm going to start with just a little data. Um, this is the fall 2018 transferable course success rates across the whole California Community College system. And when I say succeed, I mean um, that students pass the class with a grade of C or higher. So we see in the middle, the average for all students succeeding in their transferable courses is 69.64%. And then we see that Asian and white students succeeded at higher than average rates. And then all other students of color you see succeeded at lower than average rates. Um, and this is especially troubling considering that over half of our students in the system identified as Latinx. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So what has contributed to these equity gaps over time? Um, there's a few kind of bullets here. First, we, of course, we've seen the initial exclusion of underrepresented student populations in higher education. Uh, and I'll speak to that more um, in a little bit. There's structural inequities uh, that have impacted socioeconomic conditions. Um, there may be hostile or unwelcoming campus climates, which may perpetuate microaggressions or discrimination and foster feelings of exclusion in underrepresented students, and deficit thinking. Um, this is where practitioners view students as underprepared for college um, due to skills or knowledge that they may lack, rather than uh, placing the onus on the institution to implement policies and practices to promote that success. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so if we go all the way back, to the foundations of our country, we begin to see how these equity gaps can be situated, right, in history. The earliest settlers were male, Christian, uh, and they didn't identify as white. The white classification was created to classify all the European immigrants into one group in order to, uh, and this is a direct quote from that Okun article, gain the access to benefits and intentionally to pit them against and place them above indigenous and enslaved people. Uh, and like I mentioned, uh, the article is linked there from where that quote came from. <clears throat> and so white, oh, uh, sorry, same slide. <laughs> um, so white supremacy culture is baked into our norms, standards, um, beliefs into our communities. And it teaches us that whiteness holds value and is value. So white supremacy culture is reflected in the current realities of disproportionate and, and uh, systemic harm and violence directed at BIPOC folks, um, black and indigenous people of color. And we can see this play out in all aspects of life, right? We can see it in health, in education, including grading, which we'll talk about extensively today, policing, the law, the government, and on and on. Um, What's really beautiful about this Okun article on the slide is she ends with a statement of hope and she says that anything constructed can be deconstructed and replaced. And she's referring there to white supremacy, but we'll also talk about um, the educational structures uh, that create inequities, including grading, that we can deconstruct and replace. <clears throat> so the next slide there, um, if we look at 
now industrialization and compulsory education. Um, formal education in the US developed out of this whiteness, out of this white supremacy and colonial culture. Um, after the Revolutionary War, it was only 10% of American uh, families that sent their children to school, most of whom were wealthy. Um, and then in the mid 19th century, we, we moved toward compulsory education. Um, and by the end of that century, free compulsory education became available to any child, regardless of socioeconomic status. But this education system uh, constructed and reinforced standardized rules, curricula, teaching methods. Um, and it didn't really account for the diversity in the student demographics, especially with the influx of immigrants during this time. Uh, so over the past 200 years, our demographics have changed dramatically, but um, some of our practices have remained steady, including grading. Um, so if we move to the next slide, <clears throat> uh, if we look at the origin of grading, um, really the earliest form of education was built on mentorship, right? This mentee, mentor working um, intimately with students in small groups. And then from 1785 to 1883, um, during the Industrial Revolution, we see the move to an efficiency model, um, which is a way to kind of sort and classify students. Um, and this is the time period when our grading system originated. Um, it was a way to rate effectively and efficiently move students through our classes uh, quickly. So by and large, we haven't really seen a change in that grading, that traditional A, B, C, D, F kind of grading scale that we all know. Um, with some, some exceptions, right? Um, in present day, there are instructors and institutions who are doing some innovative, innovative things with regards to grading. Um, I'm sure some of you know that UC Santa Cruz used to have a narrative feedback system rather than grades. I think they've since moved back to grades. Um, and then there's some other universities, Brown, Yale, MIT, um, who are doing some really innovative things and some high school districts as well. So I encourage you to take a look at what some of those um, institutions are doing. Um, but I think by and large, we are still using the same system that was developed hundreds of years ago. <clears throat> uh, and then on the next slide, um, one of my favorite scholars is Asao Inoue. He's, I, I take him to be the leading scholar in labor-based grading. Uh, and he says in his book, I didn't understand the internal colonization. I didn't understand how grading by a single standard in all those classrooms of my youth were sending me one message, be white or be gone. And so here he's talking about how in school he felt that he needed to conform to the Eurocentric standard of education and what he calls the white standard of discourse. And if he didn't do that, he felt like he would be unsuccessful. <clears throat> um, we can go to the next one. Yeah, so traditional grading um, tends to privilege categorization or sorting students into those grade categories. Um, it privileges efficiency because instructors can grade much more quickly um, by leveraging a letter grade than by providing narrative feedback. Um, it centers subjectivity of merit. So I bet if I asked everyone here <laughs> to say what merit means to them, um, we would get a bunch of different definitions, right? Um, and that's based on our lived experiences and our priorities. Um, and there's also research that shows that two instructors who teach in the same discipline may even grade the same assignment differently, right? And so that subjectivity um, is present there. Um, Joe Feldman claims um, in his book, Grading for Equity, that an instructor may allow prior knowledge of a student's behavior or compliance or even writing style or culture to creep in while they're grading. Um, 
thus kind of tainting the overall score. Uh, and then in a way argues that, especially in the writing classroom, which we just saw tends to get centered around that white standard of discourse. Um, students who are second language learners or who are bilingual, multilingual, or stray from traditional approach, approaches to writing are at a disadvantage in the grading process. Um, and this can lead to that reinforcement of white supremacy. <clears throat> the idea that the student must conform in order to earn high grades. Um, so all of this is stressful for students, right? Um, we want to bring this back to the student. It's really stressful. They're more focused as a result on the grade rather than the learning process. Um, so they may lose that intrinsic motivation to learn and instead be more distracted um, by that extrinsic motivator of the grade. Um, and this can lead to students becoming disengaged and disempowered in the class because, um, which we just saw on the previous slide, right, with the in a way quote. Um, and as a result, this could lead to attrition or to a student being unsuccessful in the class. Um, so that's kind of just a, a quick summary there of what and who do traditional grades privilege. <clears throat> so on the next slide, we get kind of a uh, antidote, if you will. Uh, what is the way forward, right? Um, ben Simone here gives us a clear pathway uh, with regards to equity mindedness. She calls for practitioners to view inequity as a problem of practice uh, rather than a problem with students and puts the responsibility on higher education practitioners to eliminate these barriers. Um, so we can get into uh, some of the equity implications of alternative grading on the next slide here. Um, so we took these bullets here from a lot of different sources, um, many of whom are, are listed there on the slide, um, not just from Joe Feldman and Susan Bloom's books there in the center, but also all the authors in the bottom left-hand corner there who have done a bunch of research on this topic. Um, so I bet, uh, and I asked this at OTC and, and everybody raised their hand. <laughs> um, just thinking about how many of us have spent time figuring out what grade to give students um, and answering emails from students asking us to rationalize the grade that we've given them, right? That takes a lot of time. By moving to equitable grading though, this becomes very much reduced. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of time focusing on what grade to give the students. Um, and students don't need to spend time making a case for their grade. Um, so that, that does save time there. Uh, the feedback process becomes more fulfilling for faculty and it promotes learning for students. Um, and we'll talk about narrative feedback a little later on. Uh, with flexible deadlines, the faculty um, are not the gatekeepers anymore of judging the legitimacy of a student crisis, and students are validated and accommodated with their schedules and all of the compounding responsibilities that they have. <clears throat> and there's agency built into equitable grading strategies as well, so students feel empowered and a sense of agency with regards to their grade and their learning experience. Um, and then further down here, when, when faculty assume trauma also, we give students leniency, agency, flexibility. We might take into account social anxiety, any educational trauma. And all this leads to an increase in student motivation. Students start to see revision as a normalized process. Um, rather than a punishment, and it fosters student performance. So um, lots of wonderful side effects of um, equitizing our grading here. And then next slide. So um, Ben Simone also gives us five best practices for implementing equity mindedness into the classroom. And I've bolded the key points um, but think about how these relate to grading. Practic practitioners are race conscious. 
aware of and responsive to systemic inequities, view inequities as a problem of practice, rely on evidence to guide their practice, and take action to eliminate educational inequities. Um, so in the next part of our presentation, we're going to give you some strategies um, for equitized grading that hopefully you'll see will align with these five best practices that we've listed here. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it to Suzanne. So thank you. So yeah, let's take us back to that spectrum that we looked at, right? So we've we've looked at the inequities, and this was a um, a brief intro into how we got here, right? There's a lot more nuance and detail that um, we we can't get into in this time frame, but that was, I think, a really helpful way to frame us in how did we get to where we are. We're going to move over into shifting towards more equitable grading. And um, on the next slide are the topics that we're going to discuss today. So on the left are the, the changes that we're going to look at because it's always nice to walk away from a webinar having something you can do, right? We don't just wanna lay out all the problems and then walk away because that's disheartening. We wanna provide things that you can do this semester or next semester to, to start shifting towards more equitable approaches in the classes. So we're gonna look at uh, allowing revisions of work. We're gonna look at late work policies, self-assessment and peer review, the importance of feedback and connecting learning um, to the learning outcomes. So we're going to start in with uh, revisions and Bree, back to you. Back to me, okay. Um, so thank you, Suzanne. And like she mentioned, the first the first strategy that we'd like to present is revision. Um, and this really allows students time and practice to learn and grow. Um, it doesn't ask students to be proficient on the first attempt, right? Um, which makes sense, right? Because inherent in the word learning is process. Um, so it doesn't make sense to ask students to um, be perfect or meet a standard the first attempt. It centers the idea that mistakes are a part of the learning, that it's not a one and done type of process. Um, something interesting is revision also works really well with the AB 705 legislation um, because it allows students to learn and grow over time within the semester um, and gives them a better chance of passing within that one year, their um, transfer level uh, English and math. Um, and we have some examples of revision policies here. Um, so one example, students can revise any assignment up to two times, and they have three days from when they receive their feedback to resubmit. So that's, that's one kind of example you could try. Another one here, students have two revisions this semester to use at their discretion. So that one's a little bit more um, open. And there's so many others, but we just wanted to to highlight a couple here. Um, and then the next couple of slides will give you some Canvas tips if you are looking to implement revisions in your course. So in order to allow students to resubmit their work, um, in the assignment settings, you'll want to change the submission attempts to either unlimited or limited and then include you know, three or four, however many revisions you want to allow. So that is in the um, assignment and quiz settings in those individuals' activities. And then the next slide, this is looking at um, how to change the status of a submission. Um, and the next two slides are pretty similar. Um, there's two ways to do this, and this is the first way where you can do it in SpeedGrader. There's a pencil icon when you're in SpeedGrader and then a drop down menu um, comes out, and you can change that status right there to none. So, for example, um, Canvas doesn't recognize that a revision is a revision. <laughs> it sees it as a late assignment because it's submitted usually after the assignment deadline. So, if you want to change the status from late to none, you can just do that there in SpeedGrader. Um, and then the next slide is very similar. It's just the second way to do the same thing, which is in the full grade center. Uh, so in grades, you can change the status of the submission from late to none, 
um, in the column for the assignment, if you go to the individual student score, there should be an, an arrow. And if you click that arrow, then you get those same options to change that to none. Um, so those are two ways of doing the same thing there. Uh, and Suzanne, I think you're next with late work. Yep. And before I jump into that, there's a few questions in the chat. And I also want to just address something about revisions, which is we often think of revisions as something done in uh, language classes or in English essays, uh, but it can apply across the board. So I teach biology and I allow for revisions. And what I found is it allows me to help students where their answers are kind of close, but a little confusing, right? So without revisions, I had to make a call of that's close enough to be right or not close enough and it's wrong. Because I allow for revisions, I can tell the student this is close, but it's a little confused section of the book and maybe clarify it for, for you know, to improve your grade on this. So it's actually helpful for a lot more disciplines than we think about. There have been a couple uh, requests in the chat for the slides, and we will definitely share those. And um, there were some questions on late work, which I'll answer after I've discussed um, our little section here. So I'll come back to those. Don't let me forget. Okay, so with um, late work, a couple of considerations that I think are important is when we deduct points for late work, what we're really measuring at that point is no longer a student's knowledge, right? Because just that they did it later doesn't mean they learned less. And so as a, as a scientist, those numbers no longer reflect what I'm trying to measure, which is student knowledge. What it actually measures becomes compliance, right? And so that's something to consider when we deduct points for late work is, we're not measuring knowledge at that point, we're measuring compliance. The, me the um, message it sends to students is that if I don't deduct points, that I'm sending the message that learning is more important than compliance, that I'm really focused on, I wanna make sure you understand the content. It also helps our students who lead you know, complex lives with a lot going on. It allows them to continue their education even when things go awry. And it feels like things are always going awry lately. I've just been trapped at home for two weeks. And so allowing for late work is, is a nice thing um, for students that lead complex lives. One of the other kind of considerations is our students are adults. And oftentimes I hear faculty say, we need to train them that date uh, due dates matter. And I would, kind of propose that most of our students know that due dates matter. They know they have to pay their credit card bills on time or there's a fee. They know they have to show to work on time. They're adults. We don't have to teach them to show up to work on time. And so that's just something to consider as far as what are we training our students to do. The flip side of this is a lot of folks, I think, have too late policies. There's the policy in the syllabus and then there's the actual policy. And I, I did this for many, many years, right? My syllabus was no late work ever. And, and really what happened is if a student came up to me and said, I need an extension, it was instantly short. Sure. How long, how much time do you need, right? Um, and what that does is it actually shifts who is affected by the late work policy because which students are gonna be comfortable asking for that extension? Right, it's the students that are comfortable advocating for themselves. It's the students that are used to getting benefit from our educational systems, right? Students that have been disenfranchised in education, students who have been marginalized in various aspects of their lives are either not comfortable asking for an extension or have no reason to believe that it would be granted. So why would I bother? or the reason they need the extension is something very personal and traumatic and they just don't wanna tell us, right? That's the other consideration with um, requiring documentation. So as soon as we require students to document why they need an extension, one, it causes challenges for students whose 
reason may be a little too private to share with somebody. And um, two, it, it essentially tells students we don't trust them. And then three, and I think Bree, you mentioned this, is it puts us in the position of having to decide what's good enough, right? And I don't want to be in the position. I had a student once that was very concerned because she missed something because she had to take her neighbor to the hospital and the neighbor didn't have family. And, you know, and she was concerned because, well, they're my neighbor. They're not my, my blood relative. Is that good enough? I don't want to have to choose if that's good enough. Okay. So that is, and there is a lot happening in the chat. So after I'm done with this brief, you are, Sean, if you want to let me know what I should answer. But on the next slide, um, not having a late work policy doesn't mean it's a free for all, right? So what what we're not, I'm what I'm not advocating for is saying turn it in whenever, like whatever. That's not that's not what um, we want to do. We do want to give students boundaries. Right, so maybe we have a late work policy that allows for um, a two week window. Or maybe we wanna say, if, you're, if you turn the assignment in late, you no longer have a chance for revisions. Um, or you, your late work receives less feedback. And this is less about um, punishing a student as it is about giving them an authentic reason why late work, why, why due dates matter, right? If you turn something in late, I no longer have the time I need to provide you with sufficient feedback, right? This is a, um, a natural consequence of having things be, be late is I, I just can't offer you feedback because I've run out of time. So all of that is to say, we still wanna give students guideposts and we can still have consequences for late work, but those consequences don't have to be points, right? Doesn't all have to come down to points. Okay, so I think that's it for late work. What was happening in the chat while I was saying all this? <laughs> so, so I'm I'm seeing and I'm kind of copying it into a single document here. Uh, one concern maybe fairness, uh, if I may um, uh, summarize that. You know, some students they do everything on time, others not on time, but they can still get the same grade. How do you deal with that? Um, another issue might be uh, campus policies, you know, working at an institution that doesn't allow uh, flexibility to the instructors to accept late work and things like that. So those are the two main ones that I think I've kind of summarized. So I don't know if you want to address that now. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can definitely. The, the second one is easier to uh, um, address, which is, yikes, I'm sorry. Like if your campus doesn't allow you to accept late work, that's too bad. Um, the first one I think is um, the idea of fairness is often a consequence of having a different syllabus policy and actual policy. If in the syllabus, it gives everybody the same um, uh, freedom, then it's no longer unfair because it's the same for everybody. Everybody has the ability to turn things in late. And then maybe a follow up to that. Another uh, issue came up. Um, how do you prevent from everyone or many waiting to the last minute to turn everything in? And I relate to that because I had that uh, happen to me uh, a few years ago. So, yeah, I so I've tried various variations of policies and I found it's all in the wording. Like my actual policy hasn't changed but the wording of it in the syllabus has. And so if the wording was overly free, like as much time as you need, that was not enough guideposts and students did, did end up waiting too long and it was um, damaging to their grade. If the wording is the due dates are in place because otherwise you're gonna get behind and that's not gonna benefit you. But if you need an extension, feel free to take it. Students are less likely to use that because it's clear. And, and I also tend to, to um, kind of keep pushing on them if they're missing work. Like you still have time to turn this in, but remember it's gonna get harder to get caught up and kind of that high touch um, nudging can be really helpful. Awesome. All right, so let's move on to self-assessment. I was actually gonna say one more thing and I'm, I'm still trying to formulate my thoughts, but 
the idea of fairness, I, I just want to reiterate and reemphasize that these are equity minded practices, right? And inherent in equity is, is offering the proportionate resources to the students in most need, right? And so this is kind of what a flexible late policy will allow us to do is take into account the varying degrees of um, support that students need. So I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, equality versus equity. Thank you, Suzanne. You, you summed it up really well. Um, so the next strategy we have is self-assessment. And so here I'm going to be referring to self-assessment and it can be used both for um, individual assignments, students assessing their own individual work or for advocating for their overall course letter grade um, if you're doing, a, if you have a system like ungrading. Um, so self-assessment has been noted as a critical workplace skill. It involves a lot of self-reflection it can lead to insights and enhanced self-understanding. Um, and this unexpected learning that happens is really beautiful uh, when you read these responses. Um, and these skills, these self-assessment skills can be taught um, and should include both personal and course goals. And so for an example, uh, in a philosophy course, let's say, a personal goal may be for the student um, to develop more compassion and tolerance for those who differ from them. Uh, and they can write about that in their self-reflection if they feel they've become more compassionate as a result of taking the course, um, and then provide some evidence to speak to that. For a course goal, maybe you have them write about how they fulfilled the student learning outcomes for the course. Um, and then again, they include evidence from the course to um, support their reasoning. Um, Self-assessment does require training, especially of metacognitive skills, um, so that students can really dive deep into the exercise. Um, and it's also really important to teach students about biases, um, about themselves. Um, for example, stereotype threat. What we've seen, and this is really interesting, is if an instructor has a self-assessment as part of maybe their final assessment in the course, and meaning that students are advocating for their overall course grade, some students may not feel comfortable advocating for a high grade or a grade that they really deserve. Um, and they may actually grade themselves lower than what the instruct instructor would have given that, that student. Um, and so it's really key that we empower them uh, to believe in what they've accomplished um, and to really advocate for themselves. Um, and so modeling and offering samples is really, is really helpful. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the next one, thank you. So some different ways that you can implement self-assessment. Um, there's a vast array of things you can do. Uh, you can have it really open-ended without specific criteria. You could attach a rubric with standards, um, points or no points. Um, I love that option to, to uncheck points. Um, you could provide specific prompts. You could offer it as a reflective journal. Um, you could give them a checklist or a handout to work through um, for them to arrive at a grade, you know, as a result of completing the handout. Uh, you can give them rating scales. And again, all of these kinds of um, options here are available for both students self-assessing individual assignments and their overall course grade. Um, so lots of lots of things to choose from here. And I'll pass it back to Suzanne. Awesome. So peer review is another one of those skills that is worth teaching students because it's important in the workplace, right? When they they evaluate other folks in the workplace, that's a skill that matters. And it's one that we're not taught often enough. I've even had faculty say, I wish I was taught better how to give you know, good feedback, how to do those reviews. And so I think it's definitely worth training students on how to do good peer review. And our classes can be a, a place to help them do that. The other benefit of peer review is it's a great learning experience for both the person being reviewed and for the person reviewing. 
right? And and you know this. Whenever you you've tried to explain to somebody else what their um, uh, what their explanation made sense or didn't make sense, that helps you learn the material. And that's true for our students as well. So peer review is a really powerful way to both benefit the students in the learning process, train them for important workplace skills, and lighten our workload, which is always a win, right? So I know there was um, a, a discussion earlier about um, grading takes a lot of time. Right, especially if we provide feedback, as we're, we're going to talk about in a little bit. And one of the ways to kind of lighten our load, because that does matter, right? I do want to take a moment here to say when you're considering policies in your class, considering your own health and well being is important, it's valid, right? And so one of the ways I can lighten our load is to have students peer review each other's work first and then submit a kind of essentially a second draft to us, which would be. Um, uh, better than if they had just submitted the first draft. The other consideration is the peer review can either be graded on accuracy of the review or, or not, and there's benefits and drawbacks to both of those approaches, but you don't have to always grade the review itself for, for accuracy, right? It doesn't always come down to points. I think is going to be a, a thread throughout here. It doesn't all have to be points, all right? On the next slide, there's, there's two ways to do peer review in Canvas. And I'm gonna gloss over these because we've got lots of other great stuff that we wanna talk about, but there's the peer review tool, which um, has some benefits in that it allows students to annotate um, the documents. Drawbacks, not super intuitive. The discussion tool um, is another way to do peer review. So you could put students in smaller groups and use group discussions to do peer review. That tends to be more comfortable for students. The main drawback there is they don't have access to all of those annotation tools and the ability to, to provide peer review anonymously. So two tools that you can choose from. All right, onward to feedback. Great, and this might be my favorite one. <laughs> Um, so I spoke a little bit about this earlier, but um, to kind of dive in a little bit more, grades tend to reduce interest in the learning itself, right? Because it distracts, it's distracting from the learning um, because students are seeking that extrinsic grade, right? It can reduce students' per, uh, preference for challenging tasks. Um, because they might feel demoralized. For example, when an assignment is weighted at 30% of their grade, that can be really intimidating. Um, and it can therefore reduce the quality of a student's thinking because they're so concerned about the weight and the heaviness of that grade um, instead of learning and applying the learning in that, in that assessment. Um, so it can lead to an increase in, in anxiety and fear of failure. Um, which has been confirmed in multiple studies. It can heighten competitiveness, especially in classes maybe that are graded on a curve, for example, um, like many of the universities. Um, it could increase the likelihood of course, course withdrawal. So students might not think that the course is for them and might not see themselves succeeding in the course, right? Um, which of course is demotivating for them to meaningfully engage in the course and, and complete the work. So the suggestion here is to move to more narrative feedback, which is on the next slide. So in the literature, um, we see that students who received feedback only, feedback only, did better than those who received grades only or feedback plus grades. So the written feedback is the most meaningful to students and it fosters their success um, because, and, and there's a few reasons here, because the feedback really helps to establish a relationship uh, with our students. Um, I love, for example, when I give narrative feedback, students can comment right there in the speed grader comments and we can kind of converse back and forth about their assignment. It's a really interactive way to continue the conversation about their assignment. Um, and students are more likely to reach out and attend office hours if they have that relationship with the faculty member. Um, again, narrative feedback centers the learning rather than the grades. 
um, and it offers a more comprehensive picture of the learning as well, uh, because instructors can speak directly to specific things that students are doing well or that may need some more work. Um, and feedback aids in normalizing revision. Uh, revision is a really big component of my own classes. So when they when the student submit, submits an essay and they need to revise, um, I will give them a list of things to work on in their speed grader comment. Um, and then I send them the link to sign up for an office hour if they'd like some help. Um, but they have a clear roadmap of what they should focus on in their revision. And then for me, what's really great is then I can just return to my list that I put there and check for those specific things in the revision. So I'm not necessarily reading every single word again. I'm looking for those specific changes. Um, right, and so all of this helps to establish revision as a normal part of learning. Um, yeah, and I think feedback also helps to motivate students to continue learning, staying invested in the process because they are getting that that narrative feedback from their instructor. <clears throat> um, oh yes, one more slide on, on feedback. Um, so shout out to Michelle Pekansky brock I've linked there to her webinar on uh, being a warm demander and taking the warm demander approach or mindset when giving feedback. Um, so the idea here is when giving feedback, it's important to both give a push or um, encouragement, but also care. Um, so instead of using the narrative uh, feedback to rationalize the grade, you could say something like, you're doing really well on X, right? Maybe topic sentences, um, maybe work on this area. Um, for care, you can say something like, I understand how difficult this is, I do see on page two, for example, you have a really good foundation, a really well-developed paragraph. Why don't you use that as a model to then update your other paragraphs? Um, and I think this kind of approach is applicable to any discipline. Um, Suzanne and I were talking in preparation for this, and you know, she mentioned even in her in her classes in STEM, process-oriented feedback is is key. Um, so. That push plus care, I think, is important in any discipline when giving feedback. Oh, one more. Um, so we offered a list of Canvas guides here for providing feedback. Um, we've given a link for adding annotations in the speed grader so you can give inline comments on student work. Um, a student guide for viewing annotations. This I use everywhere in my course. Um, I link to this in every assignment prompt <laughs> so that students can't escape that link. I'm really hoping that they're clicking it to find their feedback. Um, a link to giving comments in SpeedGrader and you have an audio version um, option in there as well, um, audio and video. How to give feedback to quizzes, how to add captions to a video created in the rich content editor, um, and one little tidbit here, you could have students submit a Canvas Studio video, and you can then leave time-stamped comments on the studio video and have that conversation with the, with the student at a specific time, which is really cool. And then how to update notification settings so students know when they've received a grade. Um, so just some guides to help you take a deeper dive. Uh, and the last one Suzanne's going to tackle is learning outcomes. So student learning outcomes are one of those things that bring joy to the hearts of all instructors. And so we wanted to end with, with that, just kidding. The, the idea here really comes down to the transparency of why we're having students do something, right? Um, the idea behind learning outcomes is at the start of the semester, we tell students here is why you're in the class. Seems like a fair thing to tell them. And then for each assignment, we're very clear about here's the goal of this assignment, here's what you're gonna learn, here's how this assignment is going to help you meet the course goals. And so really that's all we're talking about here. Uh, there, on the next slide is 
one of the ways that you can do this is using the um, Canvas Outcomes tool, right? So if you're using rubrics, and rubrics are a wonderful way to help students understand what they're supposed to be doing in an assignment. At the bottom of the rubric, you can add in the learning outcome. That's one way. You can also describe it in, in the um, instructions of the assignment. There's lots of ways to do this, but the key is to let students know why they're doing the assignment. On the next slide, I, I wanted to walk you through a slightly different way of thinking about grades entirely. So generally, when we design our grade books or when we group assignments in Canvas, we're grouping them by type, right? Homework is worth this much percent of the class. Portfolios are worth this much percent. Tests are worth this much percent. And when students come to talk to us about their grades, if this is how we've organized the grades in our syllabus, the discussion becomes, so like for the first student there who's getting A's and everything except for homework, the discussion becomes you should do your homework, which, you know, okay, right? One of the ways that you can shift how students look at grades is on the next slide, just shifting how assignments are grouped. So rather than grouping assignments by type, you group them by learning outcome, right? So here's all the assignments that are about the endocrine system. Here's all the assignments about the nervous system. I'm a biologist, right? Here's the digestive system. And so when a student comes to you and has the question, how do I improve my grade? Notice what you're talking about is the actual learning. So for student A, you would say, you might want to work on the endocrine system. Here are the assignments that related to that. Here's how you can improve your grade by focusing on this content rather than saying, do your homework, right? In Canvas, one way to do, to do this is to use the mastery grade book, which we have a link on the previous slide if you want it to click that. It's a little more complex than we can get into here. So on the, the uh, next slide, and I'm just gonna keep us going through the end here because we're, we're getting close. Um, if we go back to our original um, image, there's a word for this, the idea of reshaping power, so completely changing how grades are done is, is kind of the goal. What we have shared are smaller bits of, of how to change your classes so that the grading becomes more equitable. On the next slide are some of those bigger systemic changes that, as I mentioned, we won't necessarily have time to talk about here. However, if you take the equitable grading strategies class, that's where we'll really take a deep dive into those larger ways of reshaping our course grades so that they're more equitable, right? This includes everything from, if you've heard about outcomes-based grading or contract grading or ungrading, those are all those bigger changes that we'll talk about in, in the class itself. Just to add one quick tip tidbit here, um, also by adopting one of the system approaches on the right, you kind of get most of the a la carte strategies on the left incorporated in into um, the whole the whole system approach. So just wanted to have that in there. Thanks. And that and that's a good point, right? If you make these bigger systemic changes, you don't necessarily have to do the smaller ones because it's already it's already built in. So we did want to um, leave you with a quick reflection and then time for some Q and A because I feel like there was a lot of questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, so on the, the next slide is um, something for you to consider. So having gone through the changes that we've discussed, what um, to what extent does your syllabus focus on grades or on learning, right? So that's a framework to look at your syllabus. Am I talking a lot about points? Here's how you earn points. Or am I talking about here is how the learning is reflected in your grades, right? It's, it's a little bit of that, that terminology matters. And then considering what changes you might want to make. So that's just homework for you after having done this. Um, okay, so I think we only have a few minutes, but were there um, 
were there questions that we wanted to address? And feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. I just want to unmute. This is Cassie Rockwell. I want to tell you how fantastic this was. First of all, you guys have got really calm, um, uh, balanced energy, the whole team here that, that's involved in this. And then the second thing is that you make it all really possible and really doable. And um, I think the key idea is you take the punishment away from us as the teacher not doing it right. And, and that helps us um, be more um, supportive of our students. Also to have uh, to share what we don't see. I think it's so important to share what we don't see, like not uh, forgetting that the, the young person who hasn't been in academia can't advocate for themselves or are frightened to advocate for themselves, where the, the, you know, the one that comes from a different environment has no problem coming up to me and saying, hey, what's going on? This doesn't work for me, right? So it's a big difference and I really appreciate that. Um, so I was just informed that your classes are the at one and I'm with you guys in the summer and I came today. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I really, uh, you know, you're going to have a student who's going to probably drive you crazy. <laughs> so thank you, Cassie Rockwell. Those are, those are the best kind, right? Um, and just a, a quick comment on the advocacy piece. It, one of the approaches that I've seen people take that is really effective is for late work, teaching students how to advocate for themselves, right? So it's, you still have to tell me that you need a late work, you need an extension. Here's how you do that. Here's a sample of an email that you would send me because you're right. A lot of students just don't know how to advocate for themselves and that, that skill is worth teaching them. And then Debbie has her hand raised. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say I've, I've had an equity class on this subject once before, and I wanted to make sure I was brushing up. The main key point here is that when I put these into practice, our school does a research on how my course is doing compared to everyone, my department, the division, the college. My classes with retention and success went up 12% which I found phenomenal. And it's not because I became a better teacher, it's because my grading became equitable. And that Absolutely. is confirmed in study after study. So thank you for sharing that, that testimony. And we have a couple more here with Russell, and then after that, Sherry. Yeah, um, I, I have been grading with points and obviously we give grades, but, um, the comments section in the Canvas has been really great because you know the students make comments and feedback, and I make comments back and stuff. And a lot of times, I do accept late work, um, but you know, um, you know, I'll reach out, I'll reach out in the comments to um, encourage them to resubmit or to, to look at it and, and make modifications and re resubmit. And 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 just on that last comment thing, um, you know, we've been getting some data back. And I think because of the comments section, um, the online classes have um, oftentimes like better success rate than than the in person ones, which was surprising to me. But I think it has a lot to do with with um, that um, comment section and the interaction there. And it can be um, specific to students. So sometimes students reach out to me, and a lot of times I reach out to them. But I am going to make modifications in my my syllabus just as a general. I think all three. All three, using all three tactics is good for that. Yeah, I have to say I've noticed the same with comments. It, I've, I've had almost um, synchronous conversations with students because I have Canvas notify me of new comments and I'll type back and they'll type back and I'll type back and um, they're surprisingly effective. Yeah, it was like a, a whole thread that we were having a discussion. It was lovely. And it's really easy for them to do that on a mobile device, which is great. <clears throat> And not sure if we could squeeze in maybe, a, okay, so Sherry? Um, yeah, I just had a, a question. I don't teach online classes. Um, now that we're out of the pandemic, I I teach in, in the art department and we do very analog type of stuff, <laughs> fine arts. Um, but I did wonder if there was a, a comparable um, or an alternative um, 
class in equitable grading strategies that didn't that wasn't specifically designed for online teaching because I was looking at the the course the equitable grading strategies and it it seems like you need to be pretty proficient in Canvas and maybe <laughs> doing things online already. So I, I think that the the equitable grading strategies course is built as for online because it's under the umbrella of at one but truly oh. and as you saw with with what we talked about today none of this is Oh, uh oh, Suzanne, Suzanne here. Yeah, yeah, she's battling weather up north. I know where she was going, um, but none of what we presented today is exclusive to online teaching by any means. And I would say you could definitely take the equitable grading strategies course and okay. implement it in your face to face courses. Great. I was just looking at the description and it was talking about got to be, you know, need know these things. I'm like, oh, no. So I'm glad it won't be an impediment then. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Know. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Can we just finish it off with Charlotte? I'm, I apologize if there was anyone else. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I have a question because this is what I'm facing now. Um, uh, some students, when they get sick with like COVID or whatever other respiratory issues, illnesses that are going on right now, sometimes I feel like some of the students feel they should be excused from the work. What do you think about that? What are your recommendations uh, to letting them know that they still have to meet those requirements, but still try to help them out? Like equitable grading, I don't deduct, but I just have to let them know you still have to do the work because for some reason they think they don't have to do it. <laughs> I have not run into that. Um, fascinating. I. I, the way I might approach that would be to say, um, to reach out to them and, and talk about, let's build a schedule to help you get caught up. So kind of skipping the, yes, you need to get caught up and, and going straight to the, here's how you get caught up. A um, bit of psychology there, but I don't know if anyone's run into that that has a better answer. Um, free. I'm, I'm hesitating because I, um, Sometimes I tend to volunteer to excuse the student in, in you know, cases where it's really severe. Um, but I, I agree with Suzanne. I think working to establish a schedule would be a really good approach. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I, I don't know why a student would assume they would be excused. I haven't come up against that one either. Yeah, I, I questioned myself about that too, but that's good. I did make a plan but I was just trying to see if there's anything else I'm missing, but that sounds good. Thank you. You may develop a COVID policy in your syllabus um, if you wanted to, so that it's more kind of representative of, of the situations that you've encountered. Um, here's what happens if you develop COVID, you still will be responsible, but we can work together. Um, that may preemptively limit um, the number of those kinds of requests that you get. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Bree and Suzanne. Round of applause. And uh, you should be receiving uh, an email, uh, or you can go to cvc.edu if you want to uh, check out the archive recording of this. So thank you all again, and everyone have an awesome weekend. All take care. <clears throat> thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.